Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carbonell and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I welcome back Rob Arnott, founder of Research Affiliates. Rob shares his thoughts on inflation, expected returns of various asset classes, value investing, the impact of passive flows on the market, and much more. Rob ends with telling us what worries him, but also what he's most optimistic about in terms of the future and the markets. All investors can learn from discussions with some of the industry's brightest minds like Rob. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with research affiliates Rob Arnott. Hi, Rob. Thank you very much for joining us today. Delighted to be here. We always appreciate having you on, um, talking to you about the economy. I think a lot of macro topics that are on investors' minds. We're going to do um, much of the same uh, today that we've done in the past. And some of the things I think that we're going to discuss are sort of where, um, you know, maybe we are with inflation and the overall economy. We'll talk a little bit about value investing, passive investing's impact on the market. And it probably wouldn't be an investing podcast these days if we didn't at least drop AI in and see uh, <laughs> what, what your current take is on that. But um <laughs> Let's let's maybe start with inflation. So, um, you know, inflation has come down, but it's not at the Fed's target yet. And there seems to be a pretty wide divergence with where people are on the no landing scenario, the hard landing scenario, the soft landing scenario or whatever scenario. So, you know, we're, what is your take right now on that? Sure, sure. Well, um, market prices are set based on narratives, based on uh, a set of beliefs that is held b- by the consensus that, that represents the consensus view and betting on a narrative is a complete waste of time. The reason for that is very simple. Narratives are usually largely true, but they're a hundred percent reflected in share prices already. So, uh, betting that the narrative will come true is the same thing as, uh, betting on nothing. Um, uh, now, that actually comes into play on both of the topics you alluded to, uh, inflation and the macroeconomy. The narrative on inflation is, phew, thank goodness that's um, over. Now we just need to wait for the Fed to push us through the last mile and get, get it back under control. And uh, the narrative is largely true. Inflation is much more subdued. It's back down into sensible territory in the three, three and a half range. Okay. But, uh, I think it's awfully useful to ask where's the asymmetry now, 10 year break, even inflation, the difference between tips yields and treasury yields for, uh, the 10 year bond is currently at 2.3%. So how do I think about asymmetry there? Is the coming 10-year inflation rate more likely to be 1% below that or 1% above that? 1.3 versus 3.3. I think if you asked 100 people knowledgeable about markets and about the economy, you'd probably get 80 out of 100 saying, well, 3.3 is more likely than 1.3. So that's an asymmetry. You can have part of your portfolio positioned to do better in a regime of elevated inflation rather than a regime of rapidly subsiding inflation, settling in at 2% in the next couple of years. Uh, The same asymmetry can be observed in the macro economy. The narrative was gosh, I hope we don't have a hard landing, to, gosh, I'm wondering if we're even going to have a soft landing, to, gosh, I think there's going to be no landing. And if that's the narrative, then the question is, which direction is the asymmetry more likely? Now, some macroeconomic variables that are interesting. PMI is currently in its worst quintile ever. 
uh, inventories are in their worst quintile ever. The yield curve slope is inverted to an extent that's its worst percentile ever. And rate of change of the cost of capital using a blend of short, intermediate, and long-term rates and using a blend of two to three year rate of change is in the worst decile in history. So cost of capital up, yield curve inversion, which historically is a remarkably good predictor of recession, PMIs and inventories all looking bad. Okay, then why is the economy just chugging along just fine? It's the consumer. The consumer is propping up the economy. The way I like to think of this is that during the pandemic, people took on the attitude, I might as well spend like there's no tomorrow because there might be no tomorrow. And that pattern of behavior has persisted long after the threat of uh, the pandemic has receded. And so we still have very aggressive consumer spending. Once uh, you don't have airdrops of money into people's bank accounts anymore, once their bank accounts run dry, there's always credit cards. Well, those are uh, now at record levels and rising relatively fast. So at some stage, you get a comeuppance. Uh, gee, I can't spend any more because I can't even borrow anymore. And so the question is, will the consumer ramp down spending before the rest of the economy has a chance to turn? Um, maybe yes, but the consensus in the market says, I'm not worried about that. That's not really an issue. And so I think there's an asymmetry in both cases. It's not that I'm saying the consensus is wrong. I'm just saying that there's an asymmetry that the consensus is more likely, uh, too blandly optimistic and uh, too little attention is paid to the adverse tale, which is not highly likely, but not unlikely. And what's interesting is both inflation that is higher for longer than expected and an economy that moves into slowdown or recession, both of those point in similar directions in terms of investment implications. Firstly, uh, mainstream stocks and bonds don't do well in the face of rising inflation expectations. Um, both of them don't do well in a recession. Well, bonds don't do well in the early stages of a recession, and then they find their bottom long before the stocks do. But this suggests a risk-off posture, uh, not because we think economic or inflation risks are uh, drastically elevated, but because we think they're higher than the consensus gives them credit for. Um, one last observation on inflation is we did a study uh, a year and a quarter ago in which we looked at the 14 developed economies that were already developed in 1970. So that leaves out countries like Singapore and South Korea that weren't developed economies in 1970. Now, if you look at those countries that have been developed for the last half century plus, that gives you 53 years of data on 14 countries. The U.S. has had three bouts of inflation above 8% in the last 53 years. The 14 countries have had 31 episodes. You can't draw many useful conclusions out of three episodes. You can when you're looking at 31 episodes. And what's interesting is out of those 31 episodes, four of them receded below 2%, meaning that the inflation got back under control within two years. Four out of 31. The length of time it took for inflation to get under control ranged from 15 months as the fastest to 26 years as the slowest with a median of 13 years. Now that is wildly at odds with the consensus expectation. I think this notion that the last mile has been discussed at length by the Fed, by 
pundits and prognosticators by Wall Street strategists. Um, I think last mile is a euphemism that replaces transitory and has roughly the same meaning. Uh, last mile presumes that you go from three and a half to, th to three to two and a half to two and then settle in there. And yes, that could happen, but it ignores the possibility. Here's a simple um, uh, experiment. If you take today's inflation, um, and if you assume that inflation for the rest of the year is zero every, every single month. Okay, that'll take you to 0. 0.7. That's great. If you assume every single month matches the trailing three-year average for inflation, which is just under half a percent a year, you finish the year at 5.6. Now, what's the market reaction going to be if we finish the year at 5.6? Again, I'm not suggesting that as my central expectation. I am suggesting that a central expectation that will be three-ish or a little less at the end of the year is, has asymmetric risk to the upside. It's a lot more likely to be um, above, let's say, three and a half than below two. And most people are anchoring on below three as the central expectation. So there's opportunities. Uh, we will put a link to that paper in the show notes, but do you remember the title of that for those that are listening that might not be right in front of their computer? The most recent one was, um, um, uh, I believe was, uh, don't break out the champagne yet. <laughs> yet. Um, yeah, well, and I think on the inflation side of it, it's like thinking of food and energy prices. This is just a comment, you know. It's not like those prices went up and they stayed up. It's not like, you know, they came down. So what people are spending at the grocery right. store and, you know, and, and, and with energy yeah. prices, it's, it's like the inflation got inflation baked in and that's the floor. Inflation is receding. It's not, it's not reversing. And it's actually stopped receding since last June. Infl rolling 12 month inflation right now is higher than it was last June. Really pretty interesting. What do you suggest for people? I'm thinking of like the 60, 40 stock bond portfolio. You know, it was a big wake up call in 2022 when the 60, 40 mm -hmm. had one of its worst years ever. Then in 2023, it kind of came back nicely. And I think those investors that were looking to diversify more sort of like almost that good performance in 2023, it sort of got their mind off of other asset yeah. classes that could be helpful. So what do you think in terms of, you know, other things that investors should be considering here? Well, firstly, um, you asked the question, what markets are unusually expensive, are priced for perfection? An obvious example would be AI, uh, more broadly, the tech sector. Um, and then you ask the question, what's abnormally cheap? Well, the U.S. stock market is at a Schiller P.E. ratio of 34. That means price relative to 10-year average earnings rather than trailing 12-month or um, uh, price to forward earnings. Uh, price to forward, I, I view as being equivalent to price to fantasy because forward earnings haven't happened yet and they might not. But um, if you look at price to 10 year smoothed average earnings, you're looking at, uh, price to sustainable long-term earnings and the U S is at 34 times. Okay. When's it been higher than that? Uh, it's been higher. It's been about the same as that briefly in 1929. Um, it's been distinctly higher than that, about 30% higher than that at the peak of the tech bubble. And it's been um, that high no other times in history, so twice in the last century. That's a little alarming. Now, okay, broaden our horizons. Let's look at developed economies around the world outside the U.S. They're at 18 times. That's a 40% discount. That's very cool. Except, wait a minute, 
developed outside the U.S. That's Europe and Japan, and we know they have problems. You used to have uh, eurosclerosis, now it's Japan sclerosis, and um, in both cases, the demographics are not exactly conducive to rapid economic growth. So, uh, gosh, shouldn't they be trading cheaper than the U.S.? Absolutely. Should be the, they be trading at a 40% discount? I don't think so. The dividend yield on a broad EFA portfolio is north of 3%. In the U.S., it's about 1.3%. It's tiny. And so when you look at relative valuations, non-U.S. is much cheaper. Mm. The word is that when the U.S. catches cold, non-U.S. markets uh, uh, get the flu. All right. That historically is true, but the history where that was true was markets where they weren't already trading at a deep discount relative to the U.S. There's also emerging markets. Emerging markets are trading at 14 times their 10-year average earnings. And the emerging markets are as um, stretched in terms of the growth versus value picture as the U.S. is meaning that emerging markets value is, is at less than 10 times earnings. Fundamental index, which we introduced back in 2004, uh, has a stark value tilt. It's, a, it's best compared with value indexes and it's trading at a Schiller PE ratio of eight. And it includes the growth stocks. It just reweights them down to their economic footprint. You can buy half the world's GDP for eight times earnings. Well, that's pretty cool. And so I look at that and I think um, there's some interesting places to invest. I've been called a perma bear. I'm a bear. Uh, bear is the wrong word. I'm cautious on markets that are very fully priced and actually disinterested in those markets because their long term forward return isn't very good. Uh, I'm not a bear on things that are cheap. I love things that are cheap. I want to ask you about uh, your, you guys have a great tool on research affiliates that looks at expected returns over, I believe, like a seven to 10 year time frame. It's, it's one of the places I like Correct. to go when I try to get context of where we are. Can you just talk mm -hmm. a little bit about what that tool's telling us right now? I mean, I assume it's probably a little more constructive on bonds than it was years ago, but probably not, not that pretty on stocks. Um, but what is that tool telling us right now? Uh, the tool is uh, our asset allocation interactive website. And rather than uh, giving the link, I'll just say if you use Google and type in asset allocation interactive, the very first thing that pops up that's not an ad for somebody else is that tool. So asset allocation interactive, uh, it, it gives you forward-looking long-term returns for 130 different asset classes uh, around the world. And um, uh, we're doing enhancements to it that will add 18 additional countries before the year is out that will add uh, value versus growth for each of these markets. And so it's an exciting tool. Now, forecasting, uh, who was it who said forecasting is difficult, especially about the future? Um, it is difficult. If somebody asks me, what do you think the stock market will return? What do you think the S&P return will be over the next 12 months? I haven't a clue. And anyone who says that they have a strong reason to believe it'll be X percent is, is probably a, a, a charlatan. But uh, tenure returns are actually not that difficult. You start with the yield, then you ask how much will that income grow over the next 10 years? Um, for bonds, their fixed income, it'll grow by zero. Uh, for high yield bonds, it'll shrink because there are defaults. For stocks, it'll grow with inflation plus a little bit of real growth. Over the long-term history, the real growth in uh, dividends and earnings uh, all over the world has tended to be about 1.5% per annum over very long periods of time. So long-term return for U.S. stocks, 1.3 from the yield, 1.5 from real growth in earnings and dividends. That gives you a 2.8 real return. Add in two and a half for inflation and you're around 5.3. So 5.3% 10 year return seems perfectly reasonable, but there's a third component of return. You've got yield, you've got growth, 
and you've got changes in valuation multiples, that Schiller P ratio of 34 is abnormally high. Historic norm is 18. We believe that in a more mature economy like ours, uh, with an aging demographic, something in the neighborhood of 23 is more likely to be a normal. So 34 to 23, that's a big spread. Now, maybe it's a new normal and 34 is exactly where it ought to be. Or maybe it needs to mean revert. Let's split the difference. Let's take it halfway. So you're taking it down to 28. That's going to cost you um, uh, about 2% per year compounded over the coming decade. And that in turn would take you down to the three and a half range. So anyway, all asset, uh, asset allocation interactive currently forecasts 4% because it makes a gentle nod in the direction of revaluation. Now, I said I'm not a bear when things are cheap. Uh, the same logic, identically the same logic for EFA gives us an 8.5% return. For emerging markets gives us a 9.5% return. 9.5% a year for the coming decades, a wonderful rate of return. Now, there's also value. The spread in valuation between growth and value is abnormally large. It's in its most extreme decile ever, in some cases, in the most extreme, extreme two or three percentiles ever. So just snapping back to historic norms, where the spread is in line with historic norms, would for the U.S. mean that value beats growth by somewhere between 7,000 and 10,000 basis points. Spread that over 10 years. That's 700 to 1,000 basis points per year. Um, chop that in half because it might or might not happen. That gives you three and a half to 5% a year. Now, if your starting point is U.S. at three and a half or four, and you add, let's say four for value, now you're at 8%. Are people going to be ecstatic with 8%? No, they'll be pleased. Take EFA, 8.5%. Add four. Now you're at 12 and a half. Wow. Emerging markets, you're at 13 and a half. So value outside the U.S. represents really an extraordinary opportunity right now. Uh, I think the growth value cycle seems to have been dead for a long time. Value rolled over in 2007, uh, cratered during the global financial crisis, snapped back big in the aftermath, and then drifted slowly worse and worse and worse until 2018 when it fell off the proverbial cliff and you had an outright value crash from 2018 to mid-2020. We haven't come back all that far from that point. Russell value from mid-2007 to mid-2020 underperformed the Russell 1000 index uh, by 37 percentage points, 3,700 basis points. It's still 3,300 basis points behind. So the value is at the moment incredibly cheap, but the value growth cycle does exist. And you do have, when value is really cheap, you have a tailwind for value because mean reversion can augment the already existing value effect. If you have elevated inflation risk, value can do very well. So, and if you have a softening economy, value can protect the downside. So I see lots of really interesting opportunities today. They just aren't where everybody's pouring their money. Do you think there's anything to this idea that this mean reversion process has slowed down and that fundamental value investors have to lengthen their time frame? You know, people talk about all these other things that are causing flows mm. in the market these days that are not fundamental related. Do you think there's anything to that? Like we're gonna have to sit through longer periods of struggles to be fundamental value investors? Uh, I think there's there's definitely truth in that. I think one of the main uh, forces at work here is the move towards indexation, which is a very powerful force in the markets these days. Uh, if money goes from non-indexed portfolios to indexed portfolios, uh, much of the money doesn't move because the index owns the market. But it really doesn't. It owns most of the market. So what happens is that the non-members in the index 
get sold and the members in the index get bought. So every hundred dollars that goes into an index fund, about $80 stays more or less where it is because the index spans 80% of the market and about 20% of the portfolio moves from non-members to members. Well, that pushes up the relative valuation for members. And <clears throat> we saw that <clears throat> uh, just two weeks ago, S&P made a, um, uh, a blunder. They um, reported a uh, list of holdings for a, a narrow niche dividend index that they maintain that didn't include one of the stocks that's supposed to be in the index. And so the index trackers for that strategy, and these aren't big index trackers because it's a niche index. Um, uh, actually, it was the other way around. Added the, they added a stock to the list that wasn't supposed to be there. And then uh, a couple of days later, they realized their mistake and they took it out. Well, the stock went from 84 to 90 and then back down to 84. That's a seven plus percent move for a little niche index strictly because the stock was added and then dropped. And that's a big turnaround. So the spread in valuation for members versus non-members of the big indexes like the S&P and the Russell is much bigger. Uh, by our measure, it's in the 30 to 50% range. Membership has its privileges. You're worth more if you're a member. And that in turn, with the flow of money into index funds, can push the valuation of these companies up. Higher valuation means lower future long-term returns. You're more front-end loading the return in the run-up in price. And so non-members ought to have higher long-term forward returns than members of the index. But that's more than offset by the flow of money into indexes as long as that flow is enough to push the prices higher and higher and higher. So that's a long-winded way of saying this value cycle, this anti-value cycle from 2007 to 2020 was undoubtedly augmented by the flow of money into index funds uh, and augmented in a big way. At some stage, that pressure, uh, if the flow of money isn't enough to keep a stock well above the level it would be as a non-member, then there's downward mean reversion pressure plus the upward pressure of the cheaper stocks being priced to give you a higher forward-looking return and value has a chance to come back. 2000, the growth value spread became the largest in history. Um, uh, a spread that was exceeded in 2020 briefly, but Value came back big between 2000 and 2007. Value outperformed growth by over 10,000 basis points, over 100 percentage points in seven years. Just stupendous outperformance. It's not impossible that we could see a similar rebound in value relative to growth in the years ahead. Um, I'm not predicting that. I'm just saying that's an outlier possibility that could happen. The opposite possibility of value underperforming by 10,000 basis points strikes me as implausible in the extreme. How do you think about timing with a factor like value? You know, we, we know this can be an opportunity, you know, for long-term investors when, when value is cheap like this, but we also know you're going to sit through a lot of pain a lot of the time to get right. there. So what do you think, like, how do you think investors should think about this idea of timing and the ability to add to a factor like value when it's cheap? Well, most people think of it in terms of, oh gosh, these companies are value stocks for a reason. They, they're crummy companies with crummy prospects and major headwinds. And that's all true. And that's why they're cheap. Um, being a contrarian investor means buying what's out of favor, what's unloved. <clears throat> and buying what's unloved is inherently uncomfortable and has a very special additional bit of discomfort. If you buy what's out of favor uh, and you're right, you won't necessarily be right right away. The chances of you buying at the exact bottom are slim to none, which means you will look and feel like an idiot until the turn comes. 
And that means that it's much more uncomfortable than trend following strategies. If you are a trend follower and you buy what's beloved, everybody loves it. And so if it goes against you, you think, oh, I got a lot of company. Um, it's too bad it's going against me, but um, I'm, to use today's parlance, I'm, I'm going to hodl, hold on for dear life. Um, uh, I'm going to hang in there. I'm going to buy the dips. Um, buying the dips on something that's unloved, out of favor, and dirt cheap is not a comfortable thing to do, but it's the only way you can assure that you have peak exposure at the bottom when it does eventually turn. You also have to be aware of value traps, and we've published some interesting papers on value traps recently. Um, <clears throat> value traps are things that look cheap on their way to zero. I wanted to ask you more about that paper because that was actually on my list of questions. I read that paper in preparation for the interview and you guys had some interesting thoughts on this idea right. of value traps. And, you know, it's kind of like this holy grail of value investing. You know, people think if I could just avoid all the value traps, then I've got this great return. But it turns yeah. out it's a lot harder to do that in practice than it is in theory. So what are your ideas on potentially avoiding value traps or at least trying to limit them? Well, we actually do uh, work with PIMCO in a product area called RAE, Research Affiliates Equity. And RAE is built on the same foundation as fundamental index. That is to say, you weight the stocks according to how big their business is, not how popular, beloved, and expensive they are. So growth stocks, if you want to own them in RAE, you're going to say, I'm reweighting this down to its economic footprint. Value stocks, you'll reweight up to their economic footprint because these are priced at a premium. These are priced at a discount. So you build in this stark value tilt by de-emphasizing growth and emphasizing value. Now, the Achilles heel of fundamental index, um, uh, it's a wonderful strategy. It has worked brilliantly um, since we launched it 20 years ago, um, measured correctly, measured against, uh, let's say, a Fama French risk, risk and style adjusted alpha. It's been relentless measured against cap weighted value indexes. It's been relentless, but it buys every value trap that comes along and it'll keep buying it all the way to zero. So, um, uh, in working, um, on the RAE strategy, we thought, do we really want to own the value traps? Well, what can you do? Mm, value traps have two common denominators. Measures of quality are lousy and, or. Uh, they're in free fall. Free fall, you can measure using simple momentum metrics. Quality, you can measure using things like uh, debt equity ratios um, and metrics of the aggressiveness of the accounting, accruals, that sort of thing. If you filter out, let's say, the 20% of the stocks that score the worst on momentum and that score the worst on... <clears throat> quality. Uh, I would jokingly say you will miss uh, 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 three out, uh, 30 out of every 10 value traps. You'll miss some dirt cheap companies that subsequently bounce back big, and you'll also miss the value traps. So one of the really fun factoids is that strategy has been alive since year end 2000. Uh, 2004. So it's approaching its 20th anniversary. In that entire history, it's owned over a thousand U.S. companies. Um, uh, not all at once, of course. And over that entire history, it's had zero go bust. Well, that's something to have a deep value strategy that's never had a bankruptcy is pretty cool. So Yes, you can eliminate the value traps. You will also eliminate large numbers of cheap stocks. So we find that that strategy um, makes for a more comfortable ride everywhere because you won't have these uh, uh, embarrassing uh, value traps in the portfolio. But it actually adds value historically. Uh, in the less efficient markets. In the more efficient markets, uh, U.S. large, international, it doesn't improve the returns, but it sure makes the ride more comfortable. In the less efficient markets, 
small stocks, emerging markets, it also adds value. It, it does better than fundamental index. So there's some interesting ideas out there on ways to deal with value traps. I haven't seen the risk and return statistics on it, but I'm just curious and interested in your thoughts. I would imagine, you know, probably much lower drawdowns, which the reason that that is important is because for investors, you know, a lot of the bad decisions come when strategies or markets sort of are like the bear market type territories. And I think controlling yeah. those drawdowns can be important for investors actually realizing the returns of a strategy like this. Right. Now, cautionary note on drawdowns, the biggest drawdown uh, of the last uh, quarter century was the global financial crisis. And that drawdown was more savage for value than for growth. More savage because the financial leverage of the value companies was greater. And so the, the impact of um, the financial crisis on value was worse than for growth. Likewise, the COVID meltdown was harder on value than on growth. So the magnitude of the drawdowns isn't necessarily smaller. The drawdowns relative to market indexes or more particularly uh, uh, cap-weighted hmm. value indexes, uh, those drawdowns relative to those indexes tend to be modest relative to the long-term gains. I want to shift and talk about what is probably the furthest thing possible from value, which is uh, bubbles and AI. Um, <laughs> you know, you've done a lot of work over your career about bubbles, about how they work, you know, what goes into them. And, you know, we have a lot of people talking about right now, AI potentially being a bubble. So I'm wondering if you apply the criteria you've looked at, like, what do you think about AI right now relative to being a bubble? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> Brad Cornell, formerly of UCLA and Caltech, that they're working with Aswath de Motoran coined the expression of a uh, big market delusion. A big market delusion is a special kind of bubble. It's a macro bubble that's in a particular industry that's new. So <clears throat> big market delusion, the internet back in the late nineties, um, electric vehicles, uh, back in 2020 and 21. AI today, what is a big market delusion? <clears throat> like I said at the beginning, prices are set based on narratives. <clears throat> the narrative for the dot-com bubble was the internet's going to change everything. It'll change how you buy and sell goods and services. It'll change how you communicate, how you uh, transmit information around the world, how you socially interact, how you get your news, how you do your research. It's going to change everything. True, it did. Um, the narrative went on to say these are the dominant players in internet and dot-com world, and they will be the dominant players in 10 years. Not quite as true. <clears throat> Disruptors get disrupted. Um, the other part of the narrative that was not true <clears throat> was this is all going to happen really fast. How much did our reliance on the internet change between 2000 and 2005? Not a lot. 2005 to 10, not a lot. 10 to 15, not a lot. 2000 to 2015, oh my goodness, yes. It's a cumulative effect. It takes time. So <clears throat> the, um, Brad and I wrote a paper, uh, suggesting that electric vehicles were a big bubble, excuse me, a big market delusion uh, back in early 2021. There were nine electric vehicle specialists, companies that made only electric vehicles. And <clears throat> Tesla at the time was priced at 24 times sales. That's a huge multiple. Um, forget price earnings ratios, 24 times sales. And <clears throat> Tesla was the second cheapest of the nine companies on price to sales ratio. One was even priced in north of 10,000 times annual sales because its sales were near zero. And uh, so we said this looks like big market delusion. Again, not that EVs, not that there's anything wrong with EVs, 
not that they aren't a big market that's on its way, that's going to change the world, but that the notion that these disruptors weren't going to subsequently be disrupted themselves was a little naive. And the notion that this was going to happen overnight was a lot naive. And so, uh, the aftermath of that is that the, the nine companies, perf all of them underperformed the S and pace and <clears throat> they underperformed, uh, by anywhere from 15% to 99% in almost exact proportion to their starting price to sales ratio. Now we, in September, um, came up with another paper in which we suggested that, uh, the NVIDIA AI, the, the paper was, um, uh, NVIDIA and AI, um, uh, revolution, uh, excuse me, breakthrough or bubble. And our conclusion was it's both as is often the case. It's a breakthrough, for sure. It's going to change the world as we know it. Big time. Um, but the narrative is, these are the players that are dominant in this industry. They'll still be dominant in 10 years. The disruptors won't get disrupted, and this change is going to come shockingly fast. So the parts of that narrative that are dubious are the rate of change of adoption of AI and the, um, uh, possibility of disruptors getting disrupted. So as we look, uh, as, as we look at this whole landscape, is AI going to change everything? Yes, it will. It's going to displace millions of jobs. Um, you guys aren't needed. I'm not needed if AI takes over our work. <laughs> But I, I did tell our, uh, uh, our all hands meeting about a year ago, um, I, I spoke with, uh, the whole company and I said, not a single person here is at risk of losing your jobs to AI. You're safe. There's no risk at all. You might lose your job to somebody who knows how to use AI better than you do. So get on it, learn how to use it and learn how to have it leverage your time and efforts. And, uh, it was, um, an interesting reaction, but, um, uh, AI is going to change everything. Um, a couple of interesting examples, uh, early days of chat GPT, I tasked it to write a children's bedtime story with, uh, uh, uh brave knights and unicorns in a wrote a little 500 word bedtime story that any child's book author would have been proud to put their name on. It was beautiful. It was sweet. It was elegant. And, uh, it captivated the attention. This was done in the space of about five seconds by a computer. Cool. I then asked it to do a short bio of me. And I didn't know that I graduated with an MBA from university of Chicago and started my career at Goldman Sachs, but I guess I must have. Uh, <laughs> so it's, uh, it makes things up. Um, I was recently reflecting back on Sun Tzu's famous book, The Art of War, uh, and I hadn't read it in decades. And so I asked ChatGPT, write me a summary, uh, um, 2,000 words or less, of Sun Tzu's Art of War. And it wrote less than 1,000 words, and it was succinct, and it was thorough, and it mirrored, perfectly mirrored my recollections. And it was so good that I circulated it to my whole management team and said, I know you haven't, most of you haven't had time to read Art of War, but it's useful. Um, here's a synopsis that I think is just brilliant. And it was written by Chad GPT. How do you think, and this kind of gets back to what you're talking about with Research Affiliates, like, how do you think AI changes our business? Like, if we look out 10 years in the future, I mean, do you think we need there's going to be way less analysts on wall street, for example, because one analyst is going to be able to do the job of 10 or uh, have you thought about like, well, how it changes the investment management industry? Well, certainly, um, in me, wall street analyst who isn't doing a deep dive into how can this leverage my time is an idiot. Um, it will 
people in the programming community talk about being overemployed. Now, this is more um, urban legend than reality, but it does exist where somebody has a full-time job uh, as a programmer, works from home, and realizes, okay, I'm working from home. I can get another full-time job. How cool is that? I can get two salaries. And I'm going to use AI to do a rough draft of my computer programs. And I'll then vet it, make sure it works, and do the final edits. And oh my goodness, this is going so smoothly. I can get a third job and a fourth job. I haven't heard of anyone with more than four. But, you know, if you're a programmer making whatever programmers make these days, uh, earning four times that means you earn considerably more than the head of IT at your company. And no one has to know that you have four jobs. Um, all right. Like I said, that's more urban legend than reality, but it, it does exist. And that's a beautiful example of leveraging your time. Uh, financial analysts can do the same. I would note that, <clears throat> um, that, uh, people like working with people. So, um, I was speaking with one of our largest clients that has a platform of mutual funds. I shouldn't say who, because I didn't clear this with them in advance, but they have a, they have a, um, uh, model portfolio and you can opt to put a million bucks into the model portfolio, or you can opt to have a financial advisor tell you where to invest. <laughs> and the model portfolio costs half as much and doesn't give you a conversation when markets are going haywire. And, um, but it performs better. It performed better during the financial crisis. It performed better during the COVID crisis. And people were redeeming out of the model portfolio in the financial crisis and the COVID aftermath, but they weren't redeeming out of the financial advisors who were performing less well, which is really interesting. People like talking to people. So I don't see AI replacing people. I see AI, or at least not in the next decade, I see AI leveraging our capabilities. Now there's certain areas, if you're talking uh, graphic arts, um, uh, AI can do amazing graphic arts. Um, uh, if you're a graphic artist, <clears throat> you can increase your productivity tenfold easily using AI. Um, and by the same token, as autonomous vehicles get past their hiccupy uh, early learning stage, um, the notion of, okay, I got to get to work, tap on the uh, iPhone, uh, whatever's the new version of uh, um, uh, autopilot Uber, uh, what kind of car do you want to take you? Um, some compact on up to luxury, um, uh, click what you want. It arrives in two minutes. It whisks you to work. Um, eventually people are banned from the roads because they're too dangerous. And when that happens, you don't even need traffic lights. Cars can go right past each other at full speed through intersections. And, um, forget about, um, uh, 55 speed limit. These things will be perfectly safe at 90. So you're going to wind up with autonomous vehicles that just revolutionize transportation. Um, uh, I was in a, um, uh, an Uber, uh, about six months ago. And I said, um, uh, uh, are you ready for autonomous vehicles? And the guy said, what do you mean? And I said, cars that drive themselves. And he said, well, I wouldn't use those. He said, but your customers would. And, um, those cars don't need a drive. And he said, oh, when's this going to happen? I said, five or 10 years. He said, I'm going to be doing something else by then. <laughs> Which is a great attitude to have about all of this. I did ask chat GPT. Uh, so I posed the question, who is Rob Arnott and what are his greatest accomplishments? And I think remove the Goldman stuff and the stuff that was wrong. I think it's a pretty accurate uh, summary <laughs> here. But but what I find interesting, sure. and what I'd like you to comment on, is 
it says that you've published over a hundred academic papers. I don't know if that number is accurate. It's about a hundred to Okay. okay. Yeah. So, and wh where I want to go on that is like research affili affiliates have such a deep research emphasis and culture and, Thank you. Thank and, you. and, and just talk about the importance of that for the, for you and the firm and sort of what your belief system is over there. Uh, that's, that's a really nuanced question. Uh, <clears throat> AI is not new. Uh, I was doing neural networks back in the eighties. They didn't work very well, so I didn't do much time, spend a lot of time on it, but, uh, AI has been around for a long time. Um, uh, high frequency traders, almost. All HFT work these days is done with AI and has been for years. So it's a computer matched against a computer doing high frequency trading. <clears throat> AI is massively data dependent. Uh, if you have thousands of samples of data, AI is useless. If you have millions, AI starts to be useful. If you have billions, or trillions, now you're talking. That's where AI can run circles around humans. Um, HFT is heavily reliant on AI because you've got billions of samples of data. And so when the bid ask spread is here, the computer can say, I think the next tick is going to be on the high side. So if somebody wants to sell, I'll come inside the bid ask spread and I'll buy it for a little more because I think the next tick is going to be up. And it's right just often enough mm. to create a, a robust alpha engine. And it's win-win. If I'm the seller, somebody's giving me a better bid than I would have had without the HFT people. But that's short term. Long term, there's too few samples. And so that's where classic scientific method comes into play. And I say classic scientific method because uh, scientific method is, is uh, much distorted in the world. Um, uh, Anthony Fauci said, I am the science. Uh, actually said that. Um, uh, no. Science is about uh, starting with a hypothesis and using data to test it. And very important, try to prove yourself wrong. One of the most uh, damning critiques in science is that your idea is unfalsifiable. You can't prove it wrong. If you can't prove it wrong, it's a useless hypothesis. So um, when it comes to longer term investing, uh, over months, years, decades, that's where you have few enough data samples that thinking about the way the world ought to work starts to come into play. Um, you can ask the question, should value win? Well, you're buying out of favor companies that are unloved. Any notion of risk premium should give you a reward for that. The reward will be positive in financial terms and negative in comfort terms. And so then there's the question of relative valuation. Is the spread in value between growth and value abnormally large? If it is, then it makes sense that any mean reversion should help you. And so then you use empirical data to test, is my hypothesis correct? And can I find chinks in that armor? Can I f disprove my own hypothesis? Um, that's not the way a lot of the quant community works. A lot of the quant community dives into the data and says, what relationships can I find in the data? If you've got billions or trillions of samples and you're doing high frequency trading, that's fine. That's the right use of the data. If you've got billions of samples, if you're dealing with factors, um, factor investing, for instance, where you're dealing with, um, typically thousands of samples of data then that's the wrong use of science. You should start with the hypothesis and test it. Don't just mine the data and whatever pops out of the data say, oh, this worked historically, therefore it will work in the future. That circularity has been deadly 
for the quant community. Um, so in closing, we've, uh, since we've had you on, you can't answer our standard closing question. So we wanted to sort of end with what worries you the most about the future, but also on the flip side, what makes you the most optimistic? Oh, <sighs> firstly, I tend not to worry much. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> pushed to name what worries me most. It's the existential threat of humankind doing something really stupid that derails humankind. It's possible, but why, why waste time thinking about that? Because if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, you wasted your time thinking about it. Either way, it was a waste of thought. Um, so existential threats would be my biggest worry, but I don't sweat it because it doesn't matter. Um, there's so much good news in the world. The world is getting to be a better and better and better place slowly, Whoa. gradually, but fast enough that intergenerationally it shows up. We live longer than ever before. We live healthier than ever before. The, um, uh, infant mortality is the lowest it's ever been in history. The the risk of dying a violent death is an order of magnitude less than it was a hundred years ago. And a hundred years ago, it was the best it had ever been. And it's an order of magnitude less now. That's cool. And that's worldwide. Um, uh, so as long as humankind doesn't do something incredibly stupid, uh, I, I have enormous optimism that, um, the intellectual curiosity of mankind and the willingness to think outside the box. Well, most people don't think outside the box, but enough do to move things forward. And that's fun. Uh, there's a wonderful book called 10 Global Trends that every smart person should know. It's kind of a cutesy title, but it goes through trend after trend after trend in the world. And it's almost all good news. We're worried about deforestation. Not true. There's more forest land today than there was 20 years ago, which is more than it was 50 years ago, which is more than it was a hundred years ago. Urbanization is allowing forests to grow. So there's all sorts of wonderful things happening. If you're patient, unfortunately, politicians earn votes and media earns eyeballs by promoting fear and anger and not spending time on the good news, which is, um, ample. Good stuff. I just got to ask, uh, before we let you go here, what is that cool painting behind you? Oh, that's, um, that's a litho from Warhol of his endangered species series. Let's see. There, there you go. go. Very neat. Very cool. cool. So, cool. so it's, yeah, nice. it's, it's a cool piece. It's, um, um, I love it. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you very much, Rob. We really appreciate it. All righty. Take care. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at PracticalQuant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in podcast may be holdings of clients of Lydia.